It's unlike any field that I've worked in before, where you wake up each morning and uh, there can be anywhere from five or ten new papers coming out that are uh, beating the previous state of the art and just the pace at which developments are happening, it's uh, unprecedented. And so what we felt was that just like the rise of graphics gave rise to a GPU, the rise of AI would need AI processors. Because um, for deep learning, we know that it's a certain kind of uh, computation that needs to happen. Dense matrix multiplication, uh, vector addition, uh, apl application of nonlinearities. So the way we designed the chip, we could emphasize those kinds of computations. So we're really fast on those. We also know that uh, with neural networks, you're often operating on these weight matrices over and over again. And so the more of that weight matrix or that state of the neural network you can keep on chip close to where the computation needs to happen, the faster it is and the more you can save on power as well. Yeah, Intel is looking at the full range of um, form factors in which AI is going to be used in the world. This is another thing I like about the field is that a lot of the papers, the models, and uh, to some extent even the data sets have been open sourced in this field. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's all these open source libraries uh, that people can get started with. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. We are on site at Intel San Diego. We are now going to be talking about the future of AI. We have Dr. Arjun Bunsell joining us on the show. Hello. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm super excited for this episode. For those that don't know Arjun's background, he's VP of the Intel AI Lab, where he leads an international team of researchers and data scientists working on both cutting edge machine learning research and data science to support Intel's products. You can find all of his links in the bio below. Arjun, let's start things off by asking you, what are your thoughts on the direction of our world? I think uh, there's a lot to be positive about and to be hopeful for and especially in the part of the world that uh, I tend to operate in day in and day out which is in artificial intelligence. It's unlike any field that I've worked in before where you wake up each morning and uh, there can be anywhere from five or ten new papers coming out that are uh, beating the previous state of the art and just the pace at which developments are happening, it's uh, unprecedented for any field that I've been part of. So um, I think it's really exciting to kind of see how all of this could be brought to bear to benefit humanity. Man, you're right about the, the speed at which the advancements are happening and trying to keep up with what is the cutting edge. It's one of the things is that just you just don't want to learn a skill or learn a technique in like AI or biotech or whatever the technique is, just for it to be obsoleted by some other cutting edge technique because then it's like all that time that we spent <laughs> learning how to do something isn't as applicable anymore. And just to be able to, yeah, like you said, keep up to have the benefits be democratized around the world and increase the degrees of economic freedom for people to pursue their their most uh, divine purposes on the planet, all that type of stuff that AI can be so, so helpful for. Um, who were you growing up that got you interested in computer science and machine learning? You are born in Delhi, in India. So yeah, tell, give us the trajectory. Sure, yeah, so I think Growing up, I was uh, into quite a bit of science fiction. Uh, read books like uh, Neuromancer from William Gibson, watched the Johnny Quest uh, cartoons on TV, and so through that got really into technologies like uh, virtual reality and artificial intelligence. And then by the time I was in high school, um, started thinking about you know how like what's the state of where those technologies are. And I think uh, both were kind of at a point where uh, there'd been sort of a hype cycle maybe around that time, like in the late 90s. 
And um, by the time I got into college, uh, I started going to professors and being like, hey, as an undergrad, can I start doing some research in one of these areas? And it was kind of funny because um, the professor said, hey, like nobody's really doing AI research right now. They're looking at other areas like neuroscience for inspiration. And so that's how I got into neuroscience, started working in a neuroscience lab. And um, kind of as I got deeper into that, got really fascinated by how the brain works. So just um, looking at how little of uh, we know about how the brain works. And um, it was kind of interesting because people were actually using a lot of machine learning to understand the data that they were getting from neuroscience experiments. And so because of that, um, I, I was kind of close to what was happening in machine learning while also doing neuroscience research. And uh, ended up going to grad school in a lab that was doing brain-machine interfaces. Um, so recording from uh, primate brains and uh, using machine learning to understand uh, the signals, to decode those signals, uh, to perform things like controlling uh, cursors on a screen or moving robotic arms, um, eventually with the goal of applying it to uh, help paralyzed people move or give them some kind of m mobility. Beautiful, yeah. And, uh, and then after that, I did a short postdoc uh, for a few years, uh, applying some of this uh, with human data, with human epilepsy data. And um, after that, I decided to uh, make a transition into industry and joined a group at Qualcomm, which was working on making a neuromorphic chip. So it was kind of a, a slow beginning of return back to artificial intelligence, so sort of using the neuroscience, but using that to inform uh, the development of technologies uh, on the AI side. And shortly after that, uh, with uh, some friends and colleagues, decided to co-found Nirvana Systems, which was basically building uh, full-stack technology to accelerate AI. And uh, we, we did a lot of great work there, and uh, sort of within a few years got acquired by Intel. And that's how I've uh, ended up here. Yeah, what an interesting trajectory. So yeah, when you're a kid, then you're like learning about all these different cutting edge fields and then you actually got immersed yourself in working on them. And also just that you, that, that to, to, that's such an important thing is that when you identify what it's like, seems like you're sniffing out what your like purpose is, what brings you most meaning to actually go and like seize those moments and go and pursue them. And then you kind of like opened up more doors for yourself as you kept doing that. And so then what, what was it then that like, when you were, when you're figuring out that like, there's so much interesting synergy and overlap between neuroscience and artificial intelligence and machine learning. And like you would, you said like neuromorphic chips, right? There's like, there's that. And then there's like, when you're doing Nirvana, you were, you were figuring out, okay, well, what is it about this full stack AI that is that, that we're not thinking of yet? Now, how did your mind sort of like start conceptualizing like the future of AI? Yeah, yeah, I think um, a few developments happened in the field outside of what I was doing at the time. So there's this technique of deep learning that uh, got a lot of prominence just around the time that we were starting Nirvana. And this is like ImageNet, right? The big... ImageNet was a big milestone that happened uh, just before we started. And before that, I mean, neural networks had been around for a long time, like since the 60s. And uh, it was just a challenge to kind of scale them to real life problems. Uh, there had been some limited applications in terms of reading the zip codes on, uh, on mail and on reading uh, numbers on checks automatically. But um, it had been hard to sort of extend that to more just images or photos that we might take. And through that ImageNet moment that happened in 2012, um, that was huge because it was actually applying uh, these techniques on much larger data sets and getting um, a uh, state-of-the-art performance that was much better than what had been possible before. 
And that was basically powered by the availability of a lot more computational power and slight tweaks to the algorithms uh, that people had used before. Uh, things like dropout and using a different kind of normalization. And, uh, and then the availability of data. So the internet allowed for a lot more data to be collected and labeled compared to what had been possible before. And so I think because um, uh, me and, and some of my friends and colleagues had been um, in this sort of intersection of neuroscience and machine learning for all those years where it wasn't working, when it started working, we kind of had these front row seats to see that, oh, like now things are working and there's this opportunity to kind of dive in and try to do something. And just given where we were and who we were, uh, we looked at sort of the hardware performance angle as that initial starting point. And, um, and then over time, Nirvana started developing uh, quite a bit of software uh, to make this new hardware platform usable. Because you know, if you just build a chip and nobody can connect it to their products, then that's not very useful. And so we uh, got together a team that was building. Uh, so for any hardware product, you have drivers and firmware. So that's kind of the low-level software. But then you need to write a lot of software to uh, run some of the basic computational primitives that go into deep learning. Things like matrix multiplication, convolution, just addition, subtraction happening on matrices and tensors. Um, so we were able to hire some of the best people in the world for that. And uh, we had our own deep learning framework. So today, everybody knows things like TensorFlow and PyTorch. But back when we started, uh, none of those existed. So we actually ended up writing our own framework. And uh, for a couple of years, it was the fastest on a lot of the benchmarks that people were using at the time. And, uh, and then we also had a cloud service, because at that time, uh, there wasn't any way for people to use AI on cloud services. And so we had the stack that went all the way up to providing cloud services. And uh, so I think that was kind of the unique thing, was um, both that there's an opportunity to accelerate on the hardware, special purpose hardware for deep learning, but then also have this very deep stack in order to uh, monetize that, get the value out into the world uh, of, of using this technology. Yeah, the timing was huge that you had already, you and your colleagues had already been at the edge for a while, and then it ended up being that finally there was a, in both actually with neuroscience and AI, and then it ended up being that there was this, finally, this hockey stick moment for the field for you guys to be like, okay, let's dive in deeper. And then when you did that, I'm really curious um, to, to unpack this with you. What was it specifically about the design of the chips and what was it about like the software for it to be able to plug into other people's applications? Uh, how did you guys figure that out? What's so unique about it? Like, why did Intel want to buy Nirvana? Sure, yeah. So on the hardware side, I think we had a few key insights as to how we could do better than a GPU, which is the hardware platform that was being used for a lot of these AI applications at the time. And uh, GPU, as most people know, was originally invented to speed up graphics applications. And it just so happened that uh, some of the computation that happens for deep learning also benefits from the use of a GPU. And so a lot of those early wins that happened, like with the ImageNet, uh, part of that was uh, how they leveraged GPUs in order to be able to speed up their computation. And so what we felt was that just like the rise of graphics gave rise to a GPU, the rise of AI would need AI processors. Mm -hmm. And with like an application specific integrated circuit, like exactly style? okay, exactly, yeah. So we felt that uh, just like in the early days, people would do graphics on CPUs until people said, no, we need something dedicated for this. Um, we felt that people were going to be doing AI on GPUs initially, but then people were going to realize that this is its own kind of workload and could benefit from an ASIC for um, deep learning. And so we had some ideas around, because um, for deep learning, we know that it's a certain kind of uh, computation that needs to happen, dense matrix multiplication, uh, vector addition, uh, application of nonlinearities. So the way we designed the chip 
we could emphasize those kinds of computations, so we're really fast on those. We also know that uh, with neural networks, you're often operating on these weight matrices over and over again. And so the more of that weight matrix or that state of the neural network you can keep on chip, close to where the computation needs to happen, the faster it is and the more you can save on power as well. Because a lot of energy is spent getting data from host memory onto the chip and back. And so that was another way we thought that we could do better than a GPU. Okay, so the so two so the two so far uh, is that you have uh, deep learning requires all these different styles of mathematics, and for you to be able to optimize those specific mathematics um, in the ASIC that you designed, that's first. Yeah. And then second is putting the computation right there on the chip rather than doing something like sending it to the cloud for the compute and then back. Is that about, or how would that, yeah? Uh, I think it's more even more local than that. Okay. So within the chip, having memory on the chip versus memory going to the chip. Okay. Versus uh, external RAM computer or something RAM. like that. Yeah. Okay, so how would you build RAM on either ASIC? Like so wouldn't that like make it bigger, you know, and yeah. Yeah, so I think typically you can't have as much RAM as, you know, DDR RAM on the chip, but there's SRAM that you can have on chip that's more than you may have for a GPU because we know that we're going to need it to store something like the weights of the matrix, which we're going to need to keep around. So um, yeah, so it won't be as big as you know, like a DDR RAM that you would expect on a laptop, but just relatively more than what you would expect in a GPU. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. This is yeah. This is start, starting to click more. So having that be local, right? Uh, the, the storing these these critical mathematical values as you continue doing more and more. Of the deep learning processes right next to the to the um, to your chip is is what you would prefer rather than having it yeah go further to the um, DDR or whatnot on the on the actual computer. Interesting, and then yeah keep keep teaching us about about this. This is it seems like the design of the chip and the design of the way that we process all the complex mathematics that need to be done. Like this is kind of like the most first principle thing. Mm -hmm. How is the chip designed? And how does it optimize all of the complex mathematics that have to happen on it? That's like the first principle, would you say? Yeah. For optimizing this. That's AI right. Feature. Yeah, and I think we know that we don't need to support things that, that are needed for graphics. And so that saves us some diarrhea to not have that logic that's needed to support graphics. And instead, we could have um, logic to um, have more connectivity between chips. So that was another big mm. part of our chip, is having a lot more bandwidth available for chip-to-chip -chip communication that doesn't rely on things like Ethernet. So that's parallel processing. Exactly, okay. yeah. And so that can allow for building much larger models and uh, being able to run a lot more data through the models. So both of, those th both of those things can help with uh, speed as well as accuracy of the models. So then, how does, a, how does one of your chips communicate with another chip? Normally you said it's via e Ethernet. They have to be both connected to the same local area network? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's but, a typical way. Yeah. Okay. And then how do you guys do it? We have a custom interconnect between our chips. And uh, that's able to provide a much faster and lower latency connection between chips. So kind of the vision that we had for our chips was to basically um, make it available to uh, any data scientist or researcher or application developer as just one, one big chip. Like that's basically how they should think about it. And because I think previously uh, people were sort of building their models right at the edge of what a GPU could do. So uh, it was funny if you looked, looked at some of the papers, um, you know, in one year they would be uh, at, at like four gigs and then the next year would be like six gigs. And so one of our dreams was that let's just uh, make it one big mesh so that people are just building what they want to build and not being limited by uh, what's available on, on the GPU uh, in terms of memory. And so then, then, then the 
Um, there's also, there's the, that was the hardware side of yeah. the construction. And then what about then, how did you make it accessible for companies to want to, to leverage it? Did they ever have to like buy hardware, them, your hardware themselves, or could they just access your hardware remotely? Yeah, so basically um, the idea ended up being that we developed this cloud called Nirvana Cloud. Mm -hmm. And uh, initially we just built it on GPUs because that's what was available while we were developing our ASIC. And uh, as I said before, we had this framework called Neon. And Neon was built in a way that you could run different hardware backends underneath it. And so if our customers built their AI programs on top of Neon, then uh, they didn't have to sort of think about what's the underlying hardware. Is it CPUs? Is it GPUs? Is it the Nirvana processor? And so the idea was that when the Nirvana processor sort of is fully developed, it would come into the cloud. And uh, customers would just see the performance improvements and not have to um, rewrite any of their code. And then is that kind of what ended up happening is as you guys made your ASICs, you added them to the cloud and then? So yeah, so I think we got acquired before we had uh, the first rev of the chip back. Okay. And uh, sort of post acquisition, the focus has been more on the silicon itself, yes. and not so much on the cloud service, just given Intel's business model. Yes. And so that's, that's where we have focused. And then you had a good amount of diverse organizations that were using Nirvana Cloud for their com computational purposes. And like, why would, why were people picking the Nirvana Cloud over the Google Cloud and Microsoft Cloud and whatnot? Because uh, they didn't exist at the time. So we were actually um, first to market with that kind of a product. So mm -hmm. when we came out, um, some of those competing products didn't exist. And um, yeah, I think people were sort of wanting to try out something that's really custom built for AI. Mm -hmm. And like you said, yeah, we showed that people could apply to agriculture, energy, healthcare, government, finance. So we, we had done engagements in each of these different industries. And we'd shown value in computer vision, in speech recognition, in natural language processing. Um, so we had a pretty good matrix of customers across these different domains and application areas. Yeah, that's huge. Okay, so a variety of different um, organizations are leveraging it for all the different um, artificial intelligence purposes. And then was there ever a concern with the companies? Because like you said, this was pre-Google and Microsoft clouds. Did it, was they're AI clouds. They, they're, the, oh, they're AI clouds. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, good clarification. Yeah, pre-AI clouds. Then, which are then they now have their own like kind of like ASIC style clouds mm -hmm. for AI specifically yeah. as well, okay. But at least Google does. Uh, yeah. Google does, yeah. okay. Was was there ever even, ba was there back then the, this, this concern and like what do you think about the future of this concern about like keeping my computations local versus shipping them off to the Intel Nirvana chips or to shipping them off to the Google AI cloud like versus keeping them local? What, what, are, what are your thoughts, but do you, do you still feel like there's going to be a great way to encrypt that and to still go and send that? Like, is that what you think is the future there? I think there's probably going to be a bit of both. I think there's some applications where people are more concerned about privacy and uh, there is more of a drive to keeping things local. But uh, I think just like with uh, public clouds in general, right, like not even thinking about AI, but just general data being on clouds or computation happening on clouds. So I think it's just part of that. I think, uh, I don't know if AI brings in any special differences. So I think if an organization is comfortable keeping its data in the cloud and doing its sort of regular computation on the cloud, then um, they would probably be okay doing the AI computation in the cloud as well. But if for privacy reasons or other reasons they need to keep that local, then they would um, want to keep the AI uh, computation uh, local as well. Okay. But also on the technology side, there are things like uh, privacy preserving machine learning, which uh, another group here at Intel has been working on. Interesting. Privacy preserving machine learning. That's hmm. right. Yeah. So the idea is to be able to do machine learning on encrypted data. Yeah. And then that way you don't have to share your personal information 
with the uh, company, but the company can still use it to do something useful and provide a service to you. So yeah. that's kind of an emerging technique which, uh, if it succeeds, could be a big breakthrough in terms of just how uh, AI is done and how computation happens for these tasks. So then with the um, AI lab at Intel then, is part of what you're doing then figuring out like for uh, NLP or for image recognition I that we have to build a specific ASIC for just NLP or for just image recognition? So we haven't gone to that level of specialization yet. Okay. Uh, we find that there's certain kind of primitives and computational motifs that are shared across these different domains because uh, they're all sort of operating within this framework of deep learning and artificial neural networks, which requires dense matrix multiplication and vector addition and nonlinearities. And so uh, even though the applications are a little bit different, the math and the computation is, is similar enough that we could service the needs of these different areas with one chip. It could be that in the future, there is a need to specialize even further within these different domains, like you're saying. OK, yeah. OK. Um, and then the other thing is on the, on the edge side of things. So Intel kind of makes products all the way from the data center to the edge. And um, on the edge, you kind of have more constrained environments with lower power and um, and yeah, I think lower computational power as well as low like battery consumption and so forth. So uh, yeah. there, there could be more of a case to have chips that are more specialized for computer vision. You know, if you're going to put them in a camera or yeah. augmented reality goggles, something like that, versus um, if you wanted to put something in like a personal assistant, smart speaker type of uh, device. Well, okay, so then. Our future could very much so be specific chips for specific applications, and everything from from cameras and sensors all the way to what is the actual um, is it is it doing an is it doing a language processing or an image processing? So it's both the data that it's processing as well as the kind of like you were also giving an example like the the. Is it does this have to be on twenty four seven or does it only need to turn on every like couple minutes to, to take an image of the area that it's looking at or whatever the scenario could be? Interesting. Whoa. Custom designed chips for all different needed applications. Yeah, yeah. I think if if you need it to be very efficient from a power perspective, that's kind of the way to go, is to make it very custom. But the trade-off there is that these algorithms are still evolving. So every few weeks, few months, you have better image recognition systems or better speech recognition algorithms, better natural language processing algorithms. So if you make something too custom, then the danger is that it's, um, it's not going to be at the cutting edge in terms of accuracy of the model. And so that's kind of the trade-off we're dealing with as people who make hardware and other companies that are making hardware always are trying to find that right balance. And then will you speak to the importance of the data, the data being structured? This is something that is now coming up more and more often in the way that we see AI is that the having unstructured data makes is a super challenging. We there's so many companies now that are even just focused on just structuring data mm -hmm. to make it easier for us to be able to have artificial intelligence applications happen. So what are you doing with that and how yeah, how is Intel working with that? Sure. Yeah, I think um uh, Intel sort of mostly operating at the hardware layer. I mean, we do have uh, some open source libraries and so forth. But um, I mean, one way to think about it is that a lot of deep learning has happened because of labeled data sets. And that's yes. enabled supervised learning. Yes. And recently, we're seeing that uh, semi-supervised learning or unsupervised learning is having some successes but maybe still not at the level of uh, supervised learning yet. And, um, and then unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning ends up needing quite a bit 
more in terms of computational resources or sizes of models. Um, like a little bit of what we're seeing with the natural language processing models that have really taken off in the last six months to a year. And so I think that's kind of a trend that affects hardware is that um, if you're learning with unlabeled data, um, you, could, you could be using a lot more of the data compared to what's being used so far. Like I, I think there's some stats like only 1% of the data in the world is labeled and uh, the rest of it is unlabeled. Yeah. And so if the algorithms get to a point where you can really start leveraging that unlabeled data as well, then that automatically means that um, there's, a, there's need for a lot more computation and that starts having a big impact on what we build. And then what else then with uh, the, on the hardware side of the future of what's going on at the Intel AI lab are you, are you seeing? Um, yeah, I think on the hardware side, it's, it's basically um, just this trajectory of providing more and more compute, uh, more memory, so people can build larger models, train them faster. And, um, and then there's uh, this distinction between training and inference as being sort of separate types of problems. Uh, with inference, uh, you care a lot about latency and uh, power. And uh, often, uh, you're just getting one sample at a time. And you want to be able to return a result back. So um, it sort of co needs different kind of hardware and, and then there's this distinction between data center and the edge. So data center is less power limited compared to the edge. And uh, so you have some different kinds of trade-offs there. Explain the data center versus the edge trade-off. Yeah, so I think um, like edge would be um, you know, anything like um, chips that could be in cameras or smart speakers or uh, self-driving cars. And uh, there's, you know, they may not be connected to a power source. So generally, when you're designing hardware for those kinds of form factors, power ends up being a big issue. Uh, with data center, uh, you could think about, you know, social networks or search engines or online photo websites where uh, you're like uploading pictures and you want to be able to search through them pretty quickly. So um, that's, that's a little bit different in terms of you can batch images together and you, could, you don't need the response right away in some cases. I mean, some cases you do, like in a search query, you might need it right away. But there's a lot of tasks where you don't need it right away. So um, yeah, so I think you just look at sort of what is the application that the customer wants. Um, do they need the answer right away? Like, does the latency need to be low or not? And are they going to be giving it one query at a time, like with a smart speaker? <clears throat> each time a person asks something, you want that answer right away. You can't wait to batch together like 100 different requests, right? So whereas uh, with images, if I upload like 10 images or 100 images, I can just put them all together and do the computation on them. So, um, so when, you, when you can batch things, that's more of like a matrix matrix type of uh, computation that needs to happen. Whereas when you can't batch things, that ends up being more like a matrix vector type of operation. And so we just have to make sure in the hardware that these two different kinds of computation are prioritized depending on what the customer is going to be using it for. OK, so in a sense then maybe edge is kind of like what is uh, like a like a camera sensor on an autonomous car, or that it's just kind of receiving the data like moment to moment and feeding it in um, for comp for compute, and then uh, the the other the other one was the data center itself, or mm -hmm. this, yeah, and yeah. then on that is kind of just like the just the centralized uh, where the data is coming in and being processed. So that's like edge versus the center. Exactly. Yeah, okay. that's right. And I think as you said before. Often when there's privacy issues, then those edge devices kind of play a role there where you can just do the computation right there and you don't end up needing to move the data to the data center to pre perform that computation. Interesting, okay. But there can also be latency reasons for doing that, for doing that, that with yeah, a self-driving car, for example. You can maybe have like a, like a 50 millisecond 
uh, latency versus like a whole second latency, which is, yeah, can be yeah. too long for certain decisions that need to be made and whatnot, if it's localized, if the compute's localized instead. Yeah. At the edge. So local compute at the edge is a big, is a big deal for decreasing latency and for security yep. as well. Yeah. So is Intel kind of like taking that into account, both like, you know, figuring out chip designs for being at the edge and having that lower latency uh, versus having the, like you said, all these parallel computes happening in the in this data center itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Intel's looking at the full range of um, form factors in which AI is gonna be used in the world. And so, you know, you have CPUs themselves, which go from you know, big honking Xeons and data centers to cores that are on laptops, and, uh, and then also atoms that are in many of the devices. And then you have uh, GPUs, like the integrated GPUs um, that are present in a lot of uh, laptops and desktop devices. Um, you have the Nirvana processor that we already talked about um, for uh, the data center, both for training and inference. And, uh, and then Movidius was another company that was acquired around the time that Nirvana was acquired. And they really focus on the low power edge part of the spectrum. And, uh, and then Intel also bought uh, Altera a few years ago, which makes FPGAs. And there's customers who use FPGAs for um, AI as well. Do you ever kind of like wonder about you know, like you guys were being acquired, all these other people are being acquired. Um, you have to like manage an international team that are all doing different uh, aspects of chip um, design and, and manufacturing for specific use cases. Does it ever feel like maybe Intel's gobbling up like a lot of, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of what's happening? Uh, no, I think um, AI is kind of a space where, you know, Intel still working towards a leadership position, so we're not um, there yet. Um, but um, I think it's great that we're, we have all these different architectures, and um, it gives consumers a lot of choice in terms of not getting locked down to just one architecture or one way of doing things. Who are the other chip manufacturers right now that are like prominent around the world? Um, so, you know, there's uh, NVIDIA has GPUs that are used quite a bit for these kind of applications. Um, and there's a lot of startups that have emerged in the space. Uh, by some counts, there's something like 70 different startups, 7-0, in this space. that are working in this space. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of uh, competition, uh, very interesting space, uh, interesting times, I think. In, is, in China, is like Huawei doing any of the chip designer? Who's doing the chip designs right now? And um, I think there's a few different companies that have announced plans to do uh, chips. Um, I think, yeah, I think Huawei is one of them. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head all the others, okay. but there's, there's a few. Too. Yeah. But Google and Microsoft don't do any chip designs themselves. Uh, Google, Google has the TPU. They have the tense processing. Yeah. yeah. And Apple does not. Uh, Apple has something called the neural engine that's neural on the engine. iPhone. So that's more for the inference, kind of more uh, power constrained type of environment. Where does Intel's AI lab overlap with the future of quantum computing? Uh, so the quantum computing group uh, is a different group in Intel labs. Um, so we're not uh, part of that group or like, yeah, so I think it's, it's a different group at this point. But then where would like, where would chip design overlap with quantum computing's mm -hmm. future? You would want to design for the potential purposes of like what quantum mechanics can bring to computation. Sure, yeah, I mean, my personal view and I think the view of many others is that the quantum computing uh, chips and sort of that wave is still, you know, at least five years out, if not 10 years out. So. In the near future, it's just going to be more iterations of ASICs for deep learning. But um, kind of the next wave could be uh, quantum. Yeah. It would be interesting to touch base with you again in the future where we have ASICs around 
quantum computing. Mm -hmm. yep. That would be crazy. Like, how are the chips going to be designed for the quantum computing era? Yeah. That's some really interesting field that, like... Yeah, there's a lot yeah. of startups and big companies working on that. So there's a lot of activity. Um, it's unclear when it gets to that level of productization. I, I think they're sort of slowly working up to <clears throat> getting the, uh, I think I've heard that maybe getting to like a thousand bit quantum computer would be uh, like a big milestone when maybe some of the big applications could be unleashed. And then what about some of the uh, issues that you're experiencing with AI? Yeah, so um, I think one of the challenges is just getting the benefits of AI into a lot of products and applications that people can use. So I think, um, you know, there's been all these promises of autonomous driving or AI applied to healthcare and uh, just a whole bunch of domains where we thought AI was going to show up. And it, uh, it's taken longer than we expected. Like five years ago, when we were starting Nirvana, uh, we, we would have thought that AI would be a lot more visible in our everyday lives compared to where it is today. And I think some of the reasons for that are uh, just uh, like it's different in different domains, but if you take something like self-driving cars, there's all these corner cases where like if you're at an intersection, you need to be able to understand the gestures that the other drivers might be making in order to make the right decision. So I think AI uh, technology tended to focus a lot on like things like identifying objects, for example, and could do really well on that. but missed out on sort of this human interaction and understanding component, which I think is going to be really important in terms of getting it into products, which ultimately they're going to still be interacting with humans. So even if you have the best technology, if you don't solve for that problem, then it's not very useful. Yeah. It's easier to detect the stop signs that look the exact same than it is to understand what a hand gesture is being had at the, cor at the corner where you're deciding on what the next action is. That's so, right. Yeah. So then what does then the like, what does then the process of like democratizing the benefits of AI rapidly and effectively around the world, especially as we start going into the general intelligences and the super intelligences, like, and where does even like, like where does even chip design come into play with being able to handle like a super intelligence? Yeah, yeah. I think um, there's there's kind of maybe a few phases to it. So I think um, what we've seen in the last five or six years has been huge advances in what people typically call narrow AI. So in a very narrow application. AI can do superhuman things. And, um, and that's been powered largely by deep learning. And we can build chips that speed that up, uh, that build larger models, uh, and, and so forth. So um, I think that trend is going to continue. And uh, we can build applications out of that that are sort of features within products. So I think that's how I would characterize it. That, um, you can go on social media sites and translate what somebody's written in a different language. It may suggest labels to you of who to tag in those images. And all of that is being powered by AI. And probably in the next wave, what needs to happen is a little bit more of this uh, human understanding, like I was mentioning before. And um, some, some level of like human reasoning kind of capabilities in these systems that may be tied together a bunch of these narrow AI approaches. And so then you start interacting with systems that have a little bit more human-like properties. <clears throat> so maybe not full-on AGI, like, you know, full-on AGI is like humanoid robots that can do everything a human can do better, which I think is still pretty far out. I think there could be this intermediate phase where you have maybe these things called agents, which mm. are broader than the narrow AI today, yes. but not sort of full-on 
strong AGI. Yeah. So maybe in like a very uh, narrow domain of human activity, uh, they can do as well or better than what a person could do, mm -hmm. but they can't do everything that a person can do. Yeah. And what, where does like <clears throat> chip design come into play for being able to get to that point of like agents and then the general intelligences? I think the question there will be, what are the algorithms that underlie those kinds of systems? Mm -hmm. Are they just a continuation of deep learning and more and more dense computation, uh, dense matrix math? Or is it some fundamentally different kind of motif, like um, operating on graphs, for example, or some kind of sparse computation, um, or like uh, something that requires trees or branching structures or you know loops and so it really depends on what are those um, constituent motifs of whatever that system ends up being so I think that's still kind of an algorithmic problem right now and to some extent there'll be some co-development right because researchers tend to explore the areas where they can run some of these experiments in, in a short enough period of time. And that tends to happen on hardware that's available and the capabilities of that hardware as they exist today. So, um, so I think that's kind of interesting, like how that core development between hardware and software happens. And that'll also sort of guide the field in general towards certain kinds of uh, exploration. Yep. And what would Intel and other uh, chip manufacturers around the world, what would maybe be an important principle for, like what, do you, what does Intel already do or what does, what would you say would be a good way to democratize the benefits of artificial intelligence around the world? There's so many people that are still, um, are still exploring their degrees of freedom and figuring out what they want to do around the world. They need their basic needs met, all these types of things. And like chip design is such a very like, you know, a top percentage of computational awareness and understanding around the planet. And so how does how do we get the, the benefits democratized? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I think um, this is another thing I like about the field is that a lot of the papers, the models, and uh, to some extent even the data sets have been open sourced in this field. Mm. And uh, there's all these open source libraries uh, that people can get started with. And um, so, so I think it's pretty easy for anybody in the world to get started with this. Um, if, if they have like, even if they just have a laptop and um, and then typically what you can do is get a pre-trained model for a particular application and then fine-tune it on the data set that you want to apply this model on. And so that fine-tuning step ends up being not as computationally intensive as the original step of getting that first model. And in many cases you can get these pre-trained models from model zoos of the various frameworks. So I think uh, there's a lot that is happening. There's like free courses that people can take. A lot of the eminent professors in the field have open sourced their course curricula and put up videos. So, um, and I think, yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of good work happening. People in the field who've been going to Africa and doing courses there. And um, so, yeah, and also at the conferences, I think people, people do want to share as much as possible with the community. Um, I think some of the challenges are that uh, that original step does end up requiring a lot of computation, a lot of data, yeah. and a lot of that original data d is proprietary to the companies. Yes. And so I think that's something that uh, we, we need to think about how we can address. Um, but, but I think outside of that, th there's a lot of really good things happening. And then, with all of the different things that are kind of you know being built into our future including like the these really strong computational capacities or the like the newest like 5g infrastructures or the newest um, biotechs or neurotechs that are evolving around our world does it ever feel like that we need to maybe like slow down and do more longitudinal testing on our own health and how it affects society versus just like kind of like move super fast. How do you feel about that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think like right now the way things are progressing, it, it is sort of whoever can move the fastest. And um, but what I'm also seeing increasingly is um, companies setting up ethics boards and having AI for social good types of endeavors. And, and we started one in the AI lab at Intel here as well. An ethics board. Oh, an AI for social good. An AI uh, group. for social good yeah. group. Okay. And and we are sort of deliberating on a potential ethics board as well. That's cool. So um, so we are taking it pretty seriously. Yeah. And uh, we stay engaged with thing with um, inter uh, company groups like Partnership for AI, uh, which which tries to study these um, issues from a community perspective, like issues that might affect all, all companies, and uh, tries to inform standards and laws and so forth. But yeah, I think um, I haven't seen anything in terms of uh, just maybe stopping outright. Um, maybe there's been a few cases recently where I think there was some you know, uh, deep fakes and deep nude kind of uh, mm -hmm. algorithms that were published. And um, I think uh, those sort of very clearly crossed the line. And so researchers said, no, we don't want to put this out in the world. And um, I think some of those were at least taken down pretty quickly. Interesting. Yeah, I like the the optimism with like ethics boards and AI for social good boards. Like I like that a lot. That 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 definitely I hope makes people feel like more comfortable and more trusting that there is it's so important to have ethicists and philosophers and moral scientists that are working together with AI scientists and biotechnologists, etc. because the separation of of there is like it's, it seems like a recipe for disaster and the reason why so many civilizations before us have had collapses and other issues because they just started playing with godlike technologies without being spiritually advanced or yeah, yeah. let's let's actually let's actually talk about um, about that like what has been your relationship with your own spiritual growth over time with God with source what is your relationship with that sure yeah I think um I've tended to be more scientific leaning um, for a pretty long time. Um, maybe I was lucky also growing up in India that I was surrounded by a lot of very spiritual people, religious people. And uh, my grandfather, he was very well read. Like he's, uh, uh, so I spent a lot of time with him and um, sort of discussing these kind of issues around science and spirituality. And so, yeah, I think I would say maybe I'm sort of 90% on the, uh, you know, scientific path, but I do leave out some room for intuition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we still don't understand consciousness really well. Yeah. And so there could be uh, things there that we don't, um, really comprehend and maybe there's something fundamental to the nature of reality that we haven't discovered around consciousness but yeah. uh, so far we don't have any evidence to support that so um, uh, it's it's mostly sort of experiential that um, a lot of people believe in something bigger yeah and that's what we have to go by yeah so then like even from the science side when we think about like your parents and their parents and their parents and their parents and mine and mine and mine and like all of ours right ancestors mm -hmm. it all does go back to a single source mm -hmm. even from a science side yeah yeah it still goes back to a single source it's eve i guess the mitochondrial eve <laughs> yeah yeah and even like <clears throat> even going you know pre you know multi-cell pre-single cell you know pre the seed of life on this mm -hmm. planet you know pre even uh, Big Bang kind of. So now that's the question is like if it all does come from a single source of, of creation, a single origin, then isn't it then all interconnected? Isn't it all then God? Isn't it, it all that? Yeah, I guess the flip side of that is with quantum mechanics, right? That uh, what we learn from that is that the world is very non-deterministic 
and um, it's yeah basically you can't predict some very basic properties of the universe uh, because they're stochastic and um, so so even though it may have started from this uh, primordial atom uh, where we are today is is uh, it's a much much higher entropy state of the universe and uh, but then on the other hand we still haven't resolved quantum mechanics with uh, gravity yeah. and uh, so maybe there's some deeper theory that combines the two that you know we haven't discovered yet that that sort of explains that maybe there is a connection at some kind of deeper level that we haven't understood so yeah <laughs> we were we were just interviewing uh, clear when with quantum gravity research just uh, uh, yesterday actually and it's he had, they have an emergence theory that they're working on that bridges the space-time with the quantum mechanics and it's very mm -hmm. interesting um, thinking about what what is it that then makes it so that the very simple laws of this origin become super duper complex where do you think then free will plays in to the equation yeah um, I think that's a really tough question and uh, you know there's free will at different levels like recently uh, you have people like Yuval Harari sort of saying that in order for humans to stay relevant in an age of AI or AGI we have to really hone our free will like know ourselves better than the algorithms know us yes. and um, so there's sort of free will at that level that uh, our algorithms are getting so good at uh, understanding us in some ways where they can predict what we're going to do or what we're going to like uh, on par with um, what we would predict or maybe better yeah. which can be used for good uh, you know maybe recommending music you like or movies you like or clothes you like or for bad in terms of recommending ads that are fake or things like that right so um, and having big consequences for elections and democracy and, and news and so forth. Um, so I think there's kind of the free will, even without getting into the spiritual level, there's free will at just a technological, societal level, which is uh, changing very rapidly in the environment that we're in right now. And then kind of at a, at a spiritual or maybe neuroscientific level, uh, it's something that, yeah, we used to think about a lot um, you know, working in neuroscience labs for all those years where we were actually recording from the neurons which lead to the behavior, you know, 150 milliseconds later. So you can record from a neuron that, that encodes that you're going to move to the right and very reliably you're going to move to the right 150 milliseconds later yeah. if that neuron goes off. And similarly for more complex behaviors like speaking, or gra grasping objects, um, all kinds of things can be predicted from the activity of these kinds of neurons. And then the question is, okay, so what led to the activity of those neurons? And you can kind of go work all the way back to a point, and uh, one view is sort of this Francis Crick view, right? So I, re I read uh, Francis Crick's Astonishing Hypothesis in the 90s, one of the books I think that influenced me to also get into neuroscience. And uh, the astonishing hypothesis being that everything we are, everything we decide, is just a pack of neurons. <laughs> and, uh, and so that's a very materialistic view that uh, everything can be explained based on um, the physics of what's going on in our brains. And, uh, but I think there's still maybe, and I think I mostly subscribe to that based on what I've seen. Uh, the, the one open question probably is just, why is there a subjective experience at all, the sort of qualia problem. And, uh, and the mechanistic explanation is that that's just the correspondence of the state of millions and millions of neurons in your brain with some external state of the world combined with the experiences you've had up to that point which have led to the configuration of the brain in the way that it is. So, um, so I think that's one explanation, which uh, could be true, and it might be true, but um, very hard to uh, kind of falsify or prove. 
And uh, so I think there, there's some um, uncertainty around that still, even maybe maybe just a little bit even. Does it ever then feel like there's a certain like maybe forces that are at play through humans as like channels and then on this like big board game of planet Earth? Um, yeah, I don't know if I subscribe to uh, that view. Um, I think it's it's an interesting metaphor and it kind of helps understand the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then maybe some of what religion was trying to do was provide a um, simple enough story that people could um, understand and uh, and you know maybe people several hundred years ago for most of human history haven't really had the time to get deep into these issues like we can because you know we're not working most of our days trying to just get our food uh, and so forth so um, so I think maybe that was a way just to like simplify some of these uh, wisdom and some some principles for people in terms of how they live their lives how to have orderly society and so forth but uh, they also make for really good movies like Star Wars you know good versus evil the force and the dark side and uh, those are like uh, timeless stories they, they never grow old but if it's uh, I don't know if I don't know. I don't think I believe that there's just something fundamental in the universe uh, along those lines. And then, how about like the overall teleology of the species? Like, what is the purpose of the human experiment? Are we all just these beautiful creative expressions of creation that are all making different, you know, paint strokes with our lives or different, you know, notes that are being played from instruments in the symphony of mm -hmm. life? Is that the point, or what is it? Uh, I think that's definitely a very beautiful way of looking at it. Um, my personal sort of experience and view has been more around curiosity and sort of um, maximizing our understanding of the universe. And uh, I think, yeah, I think just satisfying kind of more and more of our curiosity and just staying curious as well as sort of giving that additional meaning beyond what biology might say that we've been built for. And I think that's, that's something that could be independent of us as humans. It could just be a value that, you know, let's say in the far future we have AGI forms that are not carbon-based. If um, I think it would be like I would consider humanity a success if you can infuse in those beings this same kind of value of um, curiosity mm -hmm. and I think from that a lot of the humanistic values also flow like around kindness and empathy and um, a lot of things that we consider morally good just kind of naturally I think come from curiosity about who other people are where they're coming from what's driving them to do the things that they're doing. Yes, yes, embedding super intelligence in, uh, embedding consciousness in super intelligence is, is, is critical. Otherwise it's like Disney World without any kids to enjoy it. Yeah, 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 I think, uh, I mean, that's almost like a parallel question. Like, will they also have this subjective experience like we do? Yeah. And uh, it's gonna be very hard to test that because mm -hmm. they can just say that they are having it, but how do you really know? How do you feel? <laughs> how do you feel? Yeah, how does superintelligence feel? Yeah. It's a very interesting question. Yeah. Interesting. And, and yeah, I think yeah. another point there maybe is just that they could help us solve some of our limitations. Totally. And, and run billions of permutations of creative solutions versus our just like, I can barely abstractly <laughs> reason like six things at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of potential there because, right? you know, we, we are great creatures, but we are limited. And so if we can use uh, super intelligence as a tool to get to the next level as a society, that's, again, very mm -hmm. exciting. Yeah, it could be then that it's, it is that maximizing that curiosity, the amount of consciousness, like how much consciousness can the universe have that's experiencing itself? Mm -hmm. And like that's kind of this... So can we 
make it billions, hundreds of billions of humans being me having meaning, being creative, being curious across the cosmos. Yeah. Yeah. That seems to be one of the ideas of what is the meaning or the purpose of it all. Does it ever feel like we're in a simulation? It can. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I also watched The Matrix in the late 90s and I uh, was very excited by it. Uh, I think my take on that these days is that um, it doesn't, there's no way to again test it and it doesn't have an impact on what I do. So for all purposes, it's sort of um, um, not very consequential what the answer to that question is. We will be. We may be able to poke with science at, at it soon, and that could be, that could be quite interesting. Yeah. How, we, how so? Uh, that's a, that's a very good question. And <laughs> it's also like lev leveling up. Regardless, we keep leveling up our characters. We keep achieving our North Star, our divine purpose, more and more every single day. Regardless, it's like a great thought experiment and all the, all this other type of stuff. Um, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Um, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I had a daughter a couple of years ago, so spending time with her and watching her grow up is definitely very beautiful. Um, of course, I'm sure we are wired to believe that as well, <laughs> as, a, as a species. Um, My children are so beautiful. Yeah. I love watching you grow <laughs> up. Yeah, yeah. Probably also the source of a lot of problems in the world. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, selfishness yes, and, yes. and so forth. Yes. So I want to make more uh, copies of me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we ha yeah, we have to watch out for that uh, while, while acknowledging that. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I think we are equipped to appreciate beauty in nature and in relationships and um, yeah I mean we, we uh, like through meditation and uh, we, we definitely have this um, this tool in our body and our minds to um, to seek it to appreciate it and um, yeah, everybody has different ways of uh, receiving it, so we should all try to make the best of that. Music is another one. Yeah. Yeah. Art. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So you be beauty being in the uh, experience of the person that's experiencing the yeah. life. Yeah. 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 Arjun, thank you so much for coming on to the show. This has been a huge pleasure. Very Thanks enlightening. For yep. Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks. And a huge thank you to everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, your families, coworkers, people online on social media about the future of AI and the future of different chip designs and all of the different complex things that we talked about in the episode. Have more conversations around these things. Also, check out the links in the bio below to Arjun's Intel profile as well as the LinkedIn and Twitter accounts. Do check those out. And also, support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them. Help them grow. Support Simulation. Our links are below to our PayPal, Patreon, Cryptocurrency. All those links are below. Help support us. And also, go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace.